Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me and my very special guests, three of the finest actors of their generations. Please say hello to Dana Delaney, Tate Donovan, and Michael Yuri. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hey. Hi. Listen, thank you so much for doing this today. I mean, when the fans found out at Broadway World that you were all going to be here, they were all super psyched because they've all seen you on stage. Everyone is binge watching. My family is binge watching all of your television series on DVDs, just so you know that. That's what they've been doing all week. So first of all, where are you all coming from today and how are you all holding up? Dana, why don't we start with you? Uh, it's 9 a.m. in Santa Monica, and I, I have my workout gear on because after this, I'll be getting on the treadmill, and I'll be watching episode 11 of Normal People, which I will weep through because it's almost <laughs> over. <laughs> Tate, where are you, you coming from? I live in Austin, Texas these days, so, uh, and uh, I'm doing pretty good, you know? I um, I'm hanging in there. It's, I, I miss New York and I miss LA and, uh, you know, feeling for those places that are going through a lot harder times than, uh, than Austin, Texas right now, for sure. Michael, where are you coming from? I'm in doing? Midtown Manhattan, uh, in the thick of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> taking the stairs and uh, walking the dog a couple times a day and, um, but you know, happy, healthy, well. I'm. I've got. I've got uh, animals and, and a partner, and and everyone's. Uh, my parents are in Austin, actually, Tate. Uh, oh, and, yeah. Yeah, and and they're 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 great. They're well. Um, do you want me to check in on them and you you know, bring them some uh, <laughs> to fill the fish or something like that? I don't know. <laughs> the current curbside service. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the yeah the the I, I I know so I'm jealous of I'm I'm jealous of Austin because I know it's um, we've thought about like going and staying with them and and you know taking a break from from here it's just so like how do you do that how do you how do you make a move like that it's yeah it's big yeah getting on a plane is uh, or driving I don't know which one's tougher yeah I know you drive do you stay in a hotel or do you just yeah. drive straight through. Uh, Anyway, I'm sure that's what everybody's thinking these days. Everyone's playing out these different scenarios. Yeah, I'm like, right. Oh, we're, I'm in the heart of Hell's Kitchen, so we're in the thick of it here in New York. And it's like, you know, the New York theater scene shut down on March 12th, and then the world shut down shortly after that. Like, how did you all find out? Where were you on March 12th? And, like, were you able to process this whole thing right away, or did it take you a little time? Um, well, my birthday is March 13th. So I, I had a party planned on that Friday night and one by one, everyone canceled. And I was like, are you kidding me? Come on, it's a restaurant. How bad could it be? But everybody canceled. I was the stupid one thinking, oh, it's not gonna be a big deal. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Same, same here. I was in New Orleans shooting a pilot and we shut down uh, March 14th, I guess it was around. and. Yeah, we were just, you know, listening to the news from New York and thinking, oh, this, this can't happen. But when Broadway shut down and all the concerts and, you know, South by Southwest and everything just started closing down, we just like, just got this sick feeling in our, in our stomachs. Just like, oh my God, is our life over? <laughs> yeah. I was like, in LA. What was like for you? Yeah, I was in LA about to shoot a pilot and... <laughs> Uh, I went early because I, I could sort of see, I saw this coming a little, you know, I, I saw, I saw, and I, and I was nervous. And so I thought I better get there and hunker down and stay well so that when we shoot, I'm not sick. Um, and of course I get there and, and hunker down. So I got there and immediately started socially, social distancing on my own from everyone in LA. And then, and then every, every day, you know, the NBA and then Broadway. And then as soon as ours, got put on hold, I um, I got on a plane immediately and came back. You yeah, know, I wanna talk crazy. about like filming things because you know everyone's trying to find the way back into entertainment. Like you watch all these series now and you're like, oh, they couldn't film that scene today. Oh my gosh, you look <laughs> at a movie and you're like, that couldn't be filmed today. Has anyone given any of the three of you like heads up of thoughts of how they think it's all going to come back for film and television. We'll start there. 
I heard that um, SAG is meeting daily, Zooming daily to have these discussions of what will be the rules that will be laid out in the future to protect people. And we still don't know, you know, it's still being worked out. Yeah, there, there was, I just read about um, two productions, uh, one in New Zealand and one in, um, no, sorry, one in Iceland and one in, yeah. And the one in Australia was a film and they all sequestered together. So they all live together and they have this whole big town. So they're all sort of like, um, uh, sort of preventing it th that way. And then um, the Iceland tell so uh, is separating the crew. So it's only people who are involved in the camera, uh, the actors and makeup and hair, and they all wear these bands. Uh, so they don't, the crew doesn't mix whatsoever. Uh, and the prop people are separate from uh, the grip and they all have their time. It takes incredibly long. They all have duplicate um, crews. So if the prop guy gets sick, there's another prop guy right there. Uh, prop person, excuse me. Uh, and um, yeah, there's lots of testing and uh, you know, it's just, uh, and they're also avoiding intimate scenes. They're like, um, they're gonna shoot that at the end of the series. Uh, like a, there's a scene where actors have to be really close. Um, they're postponing those scenes until everyone feels as though it's safer, but it's prohibitively expensive and you know, I. I think Dana had it right. I think the unions are really all over this. Uh, they're just like super protective uh, of us and of, of the whole crew, you know? And there's nobody, nobody thinks that making a television show is worth, uh, you know, anybody's life, you know? Michael, what have you heard? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've heard, I've heard that stuff and I've, uh, you know, I've heard that, that crowd scenes are going to be, uh, a while before, you know, and so background actors are, are, you know, not going, you know, they're going to CGI crowds if, if, if they do crowd scenes or they're going to have to rewrite things without crowd scenes um, for, for a while. Uh, but that's, you know, that's, I hear so much of, uh, so, so much when, uh, of what I hear is we don't know, we don't know. Yeah, <laughs> because they they just don't know because the information is so uh, so unreliable. Yeah, from above. You know, I call everything the new now. I won't even use new normal because the normal is going to change every day. We're never going to have a new normal is going to change. So I always say, you know, everything is the new now. Every day is a new now. You know, when this pandemic happened, were you able to get creative right away? Did it take you a while? For all the people I've spoken to who lost their jobs on Broadway, it was really interesting because, you know, it's a different track you're on because, you know, a lot of these shows were supposed to open and you go from a rehearsal room to tech, you're doing changes, previews, and you're on that train and then that train stops. And then you're told to go home and it's like, what has just happened to us? And some people were saying, I was just so emotionally tired from putting a show together and emotionally drained of just trying to figure out what was happening in the world that it took them a week or two just to figure out how to get their lives back on track again. So I was wondering for you three, were you able to like be creative right away or has it taken you some time? <laughs> <laughs> this is the most um, creative thing I've done. <laughs> Well, I, I just want to say I'm in awe of Michael Yuri because he is Mr. Creative. He has been nonstop. <laughs> for, my, for me, it was the, you know, Eugene Pack uh, got in touch with me and said, would you mind reading this thing? It's, and I said, do I have to wear makeup? Because I really, I don't know how to do my own hair. You know? <laughs> and it was just audio. I was happy about that. Um, but I, I've been really, you know, I'm a little bit older, so I feel like I'm very happy to be watching old movies. And my, my latest thing is I am writing about movies. I've got this whole new thing going now where I'm watching old movies and writing about them from various sites, and I'm having a ball. So that's like my new job that I don't get paid for. Oh, you're a, you're a film critic? 
Yeah. It's not, not more just a, you know, just not a critic, but more just, you know, what I feel about them and that kind of stuff. Well, that's awesome. Because you're that's obsessed great. with TCM like everybody else, including myself. Yes. You love Turner Classic movies. Right? I love Turner Classic movies. I love Criterion. I love talking about all the movies. I, I could do that for the rest of my life. Yeah. That's so creative. Take, were, did you get creative right away or what was it like for you? Uh, me? Oh, sorry, I didn't hear. Um, did I get creative right away? I can't say that I have gotten creative right away. I, you know, I sort of, um, sort of, uh, just sort of maintaining my life. You know, I still, I still ridiculously am working on this pilot, even though we don't know if we're ever gonna finish shooting it. Uh, you know, I'm like, oh, it takes place in New Orleans. You know, when I come back, I'm gonna have a perfect New Orleans accent. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's probably not working out. Um, there's a, there's a, my character is heavily into orchids. So I have decided, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to become an expert on orchids during this whole thing. And, and I'm failing miserably. My orchids that I bought are dying and I can't get them to, <laughs> to reflower. So, uh, it, it, <laughs> I can't say that I've been, uh, extraordinary. I'm not impressed with myself. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> the orchid thing, I was given an orchid for my birthday, and I love orchids. It lasted six days, so if yeah. I get another one, it's going to be silk. Don't, don't water <laughs> yeah. them. Oh, no, the, the key is don't water them. I left mine alone for a month. I watered them once. They all came back. Really? Okay, right, well, there it is. I heard gone, ice I, cube, I, like an ice cube every month or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've heard ice cubes too, yeah. I tried the ice cube thing, but I still think I'm going silk. Silk orchids are the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Michael, you got creative right away, right? Well, I had a, you know, I, there were a few things that I had outstanding that I uh, that I didn't want to let go. We were gonna, so I produced this uh, festival called Pride Plays uh, last year, which was a big festival of queer plays, and uh, we did it at the Rattlestick, and we had we were we were we were all programmed, and we were about to like start working on it when the pandemic hit and so uh one of the one of the um one of the, the the things we were doing to ready ourselves was i had uh um i had agreed to doing a, a benefit performance of buyer and seller this one man play that i did and uh, it was going to benefit pride plays and the rattlestick and um and we had to cancel it but it, it just felt like i was ready to do it and we were ready to do pride plays. And so we had this idea, like maybe we could do buyer and seller. We could still raise money. We didn't raise money for, for the Rattlestick and pride plays, but we raised money for Broadway cares. And we, we turned our living room into a like sound stage and we did the show and, oh, awesome. and it was really fun. And a lot it of people- It was great. And it we was made, great. Thank you. Thank you for watching Dana. We made almost $300,000 for Broadway cares and, wow. and, and like uh, there were a hundred thousand views, um, or, which is like, I guess a hundred thousand households. Um, and, uh, um, and it was, you know, like we did it in, in, in Ryan was my DP. We had two, two phones, two angles, and we cleared out the, 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 the living room. We dropped the shades. We made sure the dog was quiet and we did the play and then it was over. It was like really quiet. <laughs> and Ryan and I were like, did anyone watch? <laughs> and it turns out they did, but we did it on this, this program that we're on right now, StreamYard. This is, so we did it on this. Uh, and Paul Wontor from Broadway.com, he ran it from his house in uh, the Poconos and Nick Corey directed it from Indiana and Ryan and I would, you know, adjust the lights and and uh it was really thrilling and then it was really but, th but then it was like it, it had that feeling that it was over of, of, of doing a show where you've done a show and you have that adrenaline but then it was like this intense loneliness of yeah. of not being able to like you know do it again and not having you know i mean not that i needed the applause but that's a, you know that's like a it, it, although i felt the people it was it was like sort of going out into a, a void a little bit but it was very exciting and 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 very moving and 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 i think i think it i think people were um inspired to do other things and now there have been so many wonderful things that have come out of the you know sort of pandemic theater like gene's podcast and you know like the apple play that they did at the public yeah. and um, and and the Sondheim celebration, of course, and and uh, and now and and so and now we we brought we're going to do Pride plays online 
in June um, over at playbill.com. We're going to have a bunch of workshops and some performances at night. And we'll see if we can like find some magic there too. But it helps. I will say it really helps that I have uh, I have a, 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 a quarantine mate who knows how to make things. You know, Ryan knows how to produce yeah. and, and film and 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 I I know a little bit about that too. So like we we, we you know we we've worked under um, shoestring budgets as uh, as producers and, and directors and stuff. So like we kind of we we, we weren't daunted by the task of of. Uh, of DIY uh, um, filmmaking in our apartment, and and it's been it's been fun. It's been fun. Although I will say, everything that I do in quarantine is is twice as exhausting as doing it in the real world. <laughs> like three hours on but Zoom. You're doing everything. You're, you're putting the problem. Yeah, well, that's true. <laughs> but I find three hours on Zoom is like ten hours. <laughs> yes. It's so exhausting. Well, I want to get into the podcast. What a great idea. You're all a part of the PAC podcast, which is a new spoken word series featuring star study cast performing short comedy plays by award winner Eugene PAC. It is officially launched online and will benefit the Actors Fund and Feeding America. What a great idea to do this. How did you all get involved with the PAC podcast? Uh, I had worked with Eugene before, you know, doing these plays that he writes. They're fun little comedic kind of O. Henry type plays. And um, yeah. I had done them live before. So then I think all, probably all of us have. And then he just emailed and said, you know, do you want to read this one? And it was with Tim Decay, who I love, yeah. and Constance Forslund and Paul Greenberg. And it was just a fun little piece. And I said, yeah, sure. It's called Shakers. And um, Eugene like, writes these things that are like radio plays, you know? So it was kind of the perfect medium for that. Well, let's talk about the play that you do. I'm fascinated about. Talk about who you play and what your obsession is in this play. Oh my, it's, it's so silly. I'm obsessed with a salt and pepper shaker <laughs> that I must have <laughs> that you get from ba Bed Bath and Beyond. <laughs> and then I because my that. my obsession turns into too much, and of course, it ruins my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, Tate and Michael, how did you two get involved in this? Well, the same way, you know, we both worked with um, on Celebrity Autobiography, which is another show that uh, Eugene and Dale uh, put together, which is a riot. And we had so much fun doing it. I've been doing it for, I don't know, 12 years or something like that. It's just, it's just a blast. And, um, and you know, it's funny. He, he like, you know, Eugene, like, you know, emails me and he's like, hey, listen, I've written this play. You know, is there any way you would consider doing it? You know, um, we're, we can shoot at any time. You know, check your schedule. Let me know. I'm like, uh, check my schedule. <laughs> uh, I'm free. I'm totally free. I'm available. Uh, so, yes, uh, I just, you know, of course, you know, it's, it's so much fun to, to work with Eugene and Dale. And, um, you know, it's, they, get, they have to get the greatest actors. And it's just fun, great, light material. And. You know, it's it's a blast. I I wouldn't want to be doing anything else that night. You know, <laughs> Michael, how'd you get involved? Yes, celebrity autobiography. I've been doing it like Tate for tw uh, ten or twelve years, and and um, it's 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 the it, it's the most reliable gig I've ever had because <laughs> yeah. it's always uh, it's always so fun. There's always some. There's always a, an amazing group of people. Of, you know, random, random people that show up to do it. Um, you know, Debbie Harry to like uh, uh, um, Richard Kind. You, know, you just never like you like you'd see these people in a room and you're like, wow, look at this. We've got, we've got you know Mo Rocca and Carol Kane in the same room together. It's like very like you never, just never know who's going to be there. Um, and you know, the show is always funny. It's it's foolproof. Scott Adsit, um, who does it a lot, he says it's relaxing. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's like the, it's like if you if you work hard, it doesn't work. And so it's just so much fun doing those shows. And so and so and so then Gene writes these these great. Uh, I love the O. Henry reference that he writes these these adorable uh, sketches. Uh, uh, and he has some, I think, falling planes too. But all of these things are so sweet and dear, and they are are the same spirit with which he 
cuts down these celebrity autobiographies. Uh, and, and he has such a great ear for what is, is funny. Um, and, and then Dale, uh, my scene in, uh, in April in Paris, the one that I'm in is with Dale Rafael, uh, Dean's wife and, and, and producing partner on all these. And, and um, she's running off to Paris in hopes that she's gonna fall in love. And I'm her uh, boss. I'm her. I, I play her lover in it, you know, who, oh. who wants to take her to Paris. Oh, that, oh that's you. Yeah, yeah, that's me. I'm the bad guy. You're the bad guy, and I try to keep. We all, we all had to sing April in Paris, which I had never heard before. Had you heard before? Did you know that song before? I had heard it, but I didn't really know it. I, I mean, I had to like listen to it, and then, and then right. I, I, the first time I sang it, they were like, "That's not really it." <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not an easy song, April in Paris. No, no it's very complicated. No. I'm just kind of like, Dude, could you pick a different song? I mean, uh, you can't just ask people to. <laughs> April in Paris. But the title is April in Paris too, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The whole every but every every scene, the the song is sung a different version. You know, like Frank Sinatra or yeah. Ella Fitzgerald, and yeah, it's great. It's, it's very clever and sweet and funny, but hard. <laughs> yeah. What's fascinating about April in Paris is you all take this. There were people coming all around the world. It's like Lainey Kazan and Dale were in, in, in L.A. and Sherry Shepard. Tate, you recorded this in Austin. Michael, you were in New York City. And then Casper did this in Copenhagen or Copenhagen. So it's like, did were you all on a screen together or did you do it separately? It's just separately. here. What's that? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, was, it was all audio. See each other. Yeah, it's just audio. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you just record your parts, or are you hearing the other people? I read with Dale. You know, we read together uh, yeah. on audio, but didn't see them. It, it didn't didn't see them, and and just it was fun. It's really like a ra like a radio play. It really feels yeah. like yeah. you know, the lad footsteps and doors and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I kind of feel like Eugene. I just thought of this as like the comic Neil LeBute. <laughs> 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 That's funny. That's funny. That's a great way to describe him. Totally. Because I've been I also, following his stuff for the longest time. Yeah. yeah. I also would like to say that one other creative thing I'm doing is I'm studying French online. So I do do that every day. That's my routine. Spanish? Did you say? It's French. French. Oh, French. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. You should have been in April in Paris. You can yeah. translate for us when we get there. <laughs> April in Paris. <laughs> yeah, yeah so that's it. That's how it's, that's how it goes. <laughs> Everybody knows the beginning of the song, right? Yeah. Yeah. But then it goes into "I Love Paris" from Can Can. You know, Michael would get it. What I, I love about is that new plays are put up in um, every Thursday, right, in May and June, and for people to watch or people to listen to, they go to www.thepackpodcast.org. I think it's a fabulous idea. You know, going back to celebrity autobiography, what were the funniest bi autobiographies that you each had to read? Dana, you haven't done celebrity No, I'm jealous. Eugene asked me, but I couldn't do it, but I, I look forward to doing it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, you'd be a great, have a great time. You'd be a great yeah. Liz Taylor, Dana. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> oh, that would be good. Yeah, that would yeah. be good. What um, are some of the fun ones, Tate, that you've read? Well, I tend to read Kenny Loggins, which is <laughs> hilarious. Um, you know, he's just, uh, but it's really funny. You know, a lot of people don't, a lot of young people have no idea who Kenny Loggins is. So yeah. I was like, hey, maybe we should play some of his hits. And they're like, no, 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 no. Just go out there. And, uh, be and, uh, and new age and everyone will get it. Yeah. But, um, you know, you know, I was just thinking about Fred Willard, who yeah. I met, yeah. you know, Michael was talking about how he, the craziest, the biggest stars in the world come and do this. And, it, it, and, and I got to work with Fred Willard a couple of times on it. And I mean, that guy was such a sweetheart and so funny. I mean, he need a bank statement and make it hilarious. I mean, I don't know, he just had this casual, straight gift that I would, I remember just listening to every, every celebrity, uh, you know, autobiography he read, I would hang out backstage and just like listen to him. He was just a genius, that guy. I, I, I'm, I'm bummed that he, he passed. He was such a yeah. sweetheart. Yeah, he was great. I did it with him one time. He was so good. He was so funny. Yeah, I know. He's so good. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, I really, that, that's the that's the thing is that you know you. I think Tate froze. He looks like he froze. I think he can just refresh when he comes back on again. Okay. So we'll finish t Tate when he gets back. But okay. Which one did you read? I um, they have me read um, Miley Cyrus's book <laughs> Miles to Go, um, which is very funny. I also I got to read Dolly Parton a couple of times. They have this great mashup of, uh, of Dolly Parton. They have this great mashup of singers. And I've read Dolly Parton in that. I've read Cher, which is really fun, and Celine Dion. They're all in I've played them all. I've played them all. Do you and, do voice do you do voices when you do it? Do you do Cher's voice? You know, sometimes sometimes you do voices and like 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 uh and sometimes it's better without a voice. Like with Celine Dion, the voice really helps. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, the voice really helps. Um, but then sometimes it's funny, like, like to not to not do the voice at all. Like, uh, like Tommy Lee, I did. Tommy Lee has this, this all this stuff. It's very sexual, and it's sort of funnier just to do it like innocently. <laughs> um, and I did it with. Uh, I did it in the UK actually. I did it in London, and this amazing British actress named um, Sally Phillips did. Yeah. Um, do, do you know her? Do, do you know her? She's she's. I know of her. Yeah. She's she's brilliant, and she did Madonna's book Sex, yeah. but she did it like she was Julie Andrews, <laughs> and it's it, so sometimes it's like it's funny to do a little bit of an accent, and sometimes it's it's better to just like just to to, to put put nothing on, because um, the the edits are so brilliant. What they you know the way that they they've crafted because it, it's in their own words. We read these autobiographies from the act from from their own words, and it's it's. It's insane what they write about. And, and sometimes you think this person didn't write enough. And so the editor said, okay, what's in your fridge? And then that's a chapter. <laughs> Literally like there's a chapter in Sylvester Stallone's book that's like in my freezer right now. And that's, and that's it. And then um, Paul Anka has a book and, and he's like, at a Chinese restaurant, I will have, and you just think that he didn't have enough to write. So, so he got prompted. Amazing. <laughs> I have that. Easy? I have that sex book. I have that Madonna sex book. That's a collector's item. I have it too. The, the metal, cover. the metal cover. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it came in. It came in like um, it was like mylar aluminum foil. It was that. It was wrapped in. It was. It's a beautiful yeah. book. It was all shot at the Old Gaiety Burlesque, which was the uh, stripper club next to the Lundfontan Theater. There are a lot of celebrities in that book. Udo yeah. Kier, it, who yeah. I love from all the Warhol like. Flesh of Frankenstein and Dracula. You have to look at the pictures. Udo Kier's in there. I did a movie with Udo Kier. People in there. No, you didn't. Oh, I just welcome back, Tate. Tate's what back. What do you do with Udo Kier? I'm obsessed with him. I just made. It hasn't come out yet. It's a movie called Swan Song. He's incredible. He plays this uh, this hairdresser in a small town. He's Tell a me trip. You had the best time working with him. Tell me you had the best time. He was. A, he was. Yeah, I, I had a really good time working with him. He is a trip. He's. He's. He's he's kind of exactly what you imagine he would be like. I, I would say. Because There's a lot about movies like Dana yeah. for you totally. The the Andy Warhol's the Paul Morrissey movies. There's Andy Warhol's Dracula and Andy Warhol's Flesh of Frankenstein. They were just released on Blu-ray through Europe. We have a, a dual player here. They're stunning. But Udo Kier is so brilliant as Dracula. He's I actually saw actor. I saw Frankenstein in the movie theater. Wow. When it came out. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. I remember. Okay, welcome back. We were just talking about Michael was giving us the rundown of all the celebrity autobiographies. He did all the divas too. Michael, was there an easy voice for you to learn? Is Cher easy to do? Did you do the Cher voice? Cher is a little trickier because, <laughs> you know, really the, the, the best way to do Cher is to do, yeah, oh, is to just do Sean Hayes as Cher. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, oh, and, 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 and you sort of leave it at that, like just a touch. Um, but uh, uh, the, yeah, the Dolly Parton is the easiest to do because you just kind of like twang it a little bit, and then uh, and then Arnold Schwarzenegger is tricky because you don't want it you don't want it to go German because he's Austrian and it's close to German, and you know like if you if you if you if you if you if you go too fast, it, it's like becomes like you know, this like German thing and, it, and it's weird. It's, it's the wrong idea. But I was saying Tate, cause like when you do Kenny Loggins, you don't do a Kenny Loggins impression at all. Cause sometimes it's well, better. I mean, to... Who knows? 
Kenny Loggins. Yeah. Sometimes it's better to do nothing. It, you know, it's funnier to do absolutely nothing. Right. 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 Yeah, I heard you talking they about how like they don't they don't have enough to write about. You know, I don't really necessarily blame the celebrity for writing these unbelievably narcissistic things. I kind of blame the editor. Like, yeah. why do you let someone say this yeah. about? Or, you know, like, you know, like, please cut it down. You know, like, I mean, I'll, I'll say some incredibly narcissistic things in my life, but fortunately, I have a wife and a child who will be like, what are you talking You're such a, so stupid. Do you realize how dumb you sound? And I'm like, oh, okay, right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Oh, my God. But yeah, it's, it's all those moments where somebody didn't tell the story, to, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Like Say Suzanne Summers' book of poetry. Hmm? Oh, so they asked Dana, if she could do one of these celebrity autobiographies, is there an autobiography you would like to read? Oh, boy. Like from well, a actually, movie star or something, you know, from the TCM years? Yes. Uh, oh, yes, Ava Gardner's. Yes, Her Ava name. Gardner's. I would like to do that one. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. We're on a Dietrich bend now. We just got the Blu-ray set of all the Marlena Dietrich, Joseph von Sternberg movies, all on Blu-ray from Morocco to Lady of Shang uh, uh, you know, Shanghai Express, everything. So we're running through those and they're pretty, pretty amazing. Um, someone just put on Twitter today, which I never knew, I hope it's true, that in Destry Rides Again, that James Stewart and Marlena Dietrich had an affair. I kind of like that idea. Yeah, she, she had an affair with everybody. Everybody. That was what you did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Aren't you? Aren't you supposed to? I mean, I thought that was part of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> That's why she was great. <laughs> but I love the idea that you'd want to read the Ava Gardner book because I, I was fascinated when Preston and when my husband and I first got together we used to go to Studio 54 and we used to go on Sundays, Mondays and Thursdays and we had just danced to Cher's Take Me Home and we sat on the Mylar couch and who was sitting with us it was my husband Preston myself and smoking a cigarette Ava Gardner, and we had a 30 minute conversation with her, which goes down as one of the top 10 best things I've ever done. She was just the coolest. We just talked about Hollywood and everything else. But it was like, I'm like, Preston, look who's sitting next to us. It's Ava Gardner. And she was so down to earth, but a movie star from the old school, you know, really fascinating. Yeah. Oh, wow. You're so yeah. lucky. Well, you know, I want to go back to this podcast because, you know, what's benefiting from the podcast is the Actors Fund and Feeding America. And, you know, last night I made a nice donation to Feeding America because I had heard of Feeding America, but I really didn't know what they did. Boy, these are really special organizations. What do these organizations mean to each of you, especially well, now with what we're going through? I know Feeding America because I had worked with them for a while because I have a lot of chef friends. And, yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of kids now who are not getting food, you know, who are, there's a word for it. It's a weird word. Um, food. What is it? Food something. But anyway, uh, because they usually get their lunch at school and they're not going to school. So they don't have any lunch because they can't afford it. So it's that kind of thing where it, it makes people who, who just, you know, are lower income people get food. Yeah. I mean, it, it's literally even a dollar you donate give so many meals to people. I mean, people don't have yeah. to donate a lot of money, even the smallest amounts of money at Feeding America, a dollar will feed like 10 meals or something. When I was mm -hmm. reading it, I was fascinated by that. Michael, what these organizations mean to you? Well, the Actors Fund uh, is is such an incredible organization that that ha has for, for many years now been um, been available to people in the entertainment industry who need uh, like anything, but, but especially healthcare. Uh, there's the Al Hirschfeld Free Clinic in New York, where um, where where people, if you have a if you have a pay stub from an entertainment job, you can get seen by a doctor for free, and um, and they have uh, 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 you know uh, um, the uh, retirement communities, and and they have um, uh, resources for for people who are hard up during during any time, but but obviously now because everything is on hold, um, I think these the the Actors Fund and and a step and Broadway cares they're, they're getting pulled in lots of different directions and they're really getting taxed. So, um, it's really helpful. You know, like everybody's sitting at home watching, uh, binge watching TV shows, 
but no TV shows are getting made right now. And so, you know, it's not, it's not just like people who appear on them that, that are, that are working. It's all the people that make them, uh, all the people that, 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 uh, distribute them, uh, all the people that broker the deals, all of those people are out of work right now. And, 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 uh, and the, the, the actors fund is, is helping any of those people. It's not just, it's not just like, Movie stars, TV stars. It's 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 anyone in the show, in 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 the business we call show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tate. For you, what feeding America and the Actors Fund? Because of course, you know this podcast is is benefiting them. What these organizations mean to you, especially now. Well, feeding America <clears throat> is great. I've 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 known about feeding America. As a matter of fact, I, every week I've been going to food banks yeah. and giving. Um, big boxes of food to uh, these in little towns or in, in the big city here. And I mean, people are living up for miles. I mean, hundreds of that. One day uh, we gave out 2000 families got uh, food from these food banks and it's, and it's good food. And it's, it's an incredibly efficient organization. It is picking up the slack for all these people, and there are hundreds of thousands of families that are are going hungry, and it is a hard time. And and when you see, uh, you know, they drive up, um, you got, you got your mask on, and you 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 um, you they open their truck, and you stick this box of food, like really good food, um, and in their trunk, and you just see the smile on their face or the gratefulness on their face. Uh, it, it's one of the best things I've done throughout this this COVID crisis is volunteering for food banks, and they're all supported and connected through Feeding America. And and it's it's kind of um it's extraordinary how they'll they'll have an excess of potatoes up in Wisconsin, and they know about it, and they get some trucks that are empty that have to go back to LA, and they it, it's incredible how well organized they are. So. Anything you can do to support Feeding America, your money and your time is going like directly and and because that's what we were talking about. You could donate a dollar or five dollars or anything, and it will really help a lot of people out. You know, there are a lot of people who were supposed to make their Broadway debuts when Broadway shut down, and I'm hoping they all get that opportunity to do it when theater comes back again. But, you know, Broadway debuts are so special and you all made them. And I was wondering, do you remember what those magical <laughs> nights were like? I mean, Dana, I'll start with you because yours was at the Morosco Theater, which yes. was, still remains one of my all-time favorite theaters. I think it was you, Leonard's Alive. I was there because Da mm -hmm. was one of my favorite plays. Would you talk about what that debut, that night, and that whole production meant to you? Wow, um, I think I was 24. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, the, the biggest thrill for me was the actors that I was working with, uh, Roy Dotrys and Pat Hingle. Um, wow. They, I mean, I just, I think the thing, and, and Helen, um, Helen Stenborg. Stenborg, I played yeah. the young Helen Stenborg. And you know, when you're a young actor, you just want to put everything out, like, I. I, I was like playing everything all at once. And, and I had so much in me. <laughs> and I, I remember Helen giving me such great advice. She said, just start at the beginning, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and just go step by. And I, and I was like, oh yeah, right. And the other thing is I remember once in rehearsal, Pat Hingle said to me, cause he was such a lovely man. And, you know, he was, you know, God from, you know, the actor studio, you know, the group, all the, you know, he went way back. And I remember him looking at me and saying to me, you've really got something. I thought, oh. <laughs> it just, that, that kind of held me for, for years just to remember that because, you know, I really didn't know what I was doing. I kind of had to go back to acting class after that. <laughs> and but it was you know, very isn't exciting. It great, isn't it great when actors of that caliber, that's mm -hmm. a master class. I mean, to me, you couldn't yeah. learn anything. You know, I've always, I've always talked to a lot of stars like, I think it was Dr. Channing, a lot of people didn't go to acting class. A lot of people that I talked to said, I, I went to college or whatever, and then I had a mentor who said, do this, start working. Yeah. You know, I mean, and they said, that's how you learn. I mean, you can learn, you yeah. know, the craft and everything like, you know, 
in school and all of that, but it's actually by doing and working and watching people, like I said, Roy Joe Treats, Helen Stemborn, Pat Hingle, patting you on yeah. the shoulder back then, when you're yeah. sort of finding your way saying, oh my God, am I Broadway, am I good enough for this? You know, yeah. I'm working with the best of the best. You know, that's yeah. what you take away from that. Yeah, and I also would like to say for me, it was really special because my father got to see me in it and he was dying of cancer and he died um, uh, a month after we closed. And it was just so great that he got to see me do that before he died. So that was really special. Yeah. Michael, yours was how to succeed. Yeah, um, it was how to succeed in business without really trying uh, the revival that starred um, Daniel Radcliffe, but I was a replacement. I replaced Christopher Hankey and I went in with Nick Jonas yeah. uh, and we started the same night and Bo Bridges uh, was uh, my uncle in the show. And um, that was a musical that I had seen when I was uh, a kid. Ralph Macchio did the tour of the Matthew Broderick revival and it came through Dallas and I saw it and I'm not, you know, a real singer or dancer. Um, but I saw it and I was like, that's a musical I could do. Uh, cause it's so funny. And the, the movements are not, you know, it's not like, it's not like ballet or tap. It's like, it's like movement. Uh, I mean, you need to be able to move and like, and like certainly there was some, and certainly in Rob Ashford's production, there was a lot of dance. And that was very challenging for me to learn. But um, but uh, I, I said I could sing those songs and I fit in this world and um, and, and I want to be in the show. So I weaseled my way into that revival. I, I asked Craig Zayden and Neil Marin to put me in it. And they did. And um, that's how I've gotten all my best jobs, actually, was by by asking for them. Um, wow. And. And I remember, not only do I remember the night, I remember the moment when I was first on Broadway. Um, it was at the end of the uh, opening number. My character didn't come in for a, a few scenes, but everyone was at the, it was in the opening number. And it was this huge dance and crazy thing and all these like moments and scenes and jokes and learning about this company that he worked for. And then at the end, everyone gets in a line and the big boss, who was Bo Bridges, walks down the line, and that's when you meet him, and it's this great, and everyone applauds. And, uh, and, and I was at the very top of the line, so I was all the way upstage. So I, I remember, I remember the, my entrance, which was basically just like, basically just this. <laughs> and it was like so simple. It was like such a, I just, I just like stepped out from behind a curtain, and I was on Broadway. And I looked out and that's all I had to do. And then I went off and I was like, I did it. <laughs> and then I had to, you know, do the rest of the show. But the actual like debut was just standing all the way upstage. No one could even really see me. Um, but I was able to look out at, and, and every, anytime I've been in a show with somebody who was making their Broadway debut, I've said that, I've said, make sure you look out at some point because you have to remember what that looks like. You know, we have to remember what it looks like from, from the stage, what it looked like that night, the first night. Michael, was that before I met you or after I met you? And I think it was, I think it was after because we met, remember we met in Monte Carlo? We did. <laughs> Were you vacationing there? Were you working? They do a TV festival. All three of us were there at the same time, actually. For the Monte Is that right? We flew in together with the Kardashians before they were Kardashians. Before that show hit. That's right. We flew in out to uh, the yeah. Kardashians. Yeah. We were right. all at the Monte Carlo Television Festival together. It was so yeah, I, I remember <laughs> asking them, like, who were they? Like, we, I, I sat next to them on the plane, and I had no idea who the Kardashians were. I, I don't, and I was like, so what, what are you doing here? What show are you on? And they're like, no, we have our own show. And I was like, their own show? I never heard of you. I remember uh, you You were sitting next to Chris Kardashian and you said, well, what do yeah, you do? Yeah, okay. And you said, well, I'm yeah. their, and she said, she said, well, I'm their manager. And I remember you got this look in your face like, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> were you all on the plane together? Tate and I were. I wasn't, I on, I wasn't was. on that flight. A lot, I, of, us, I, a lot of us were. But the festival, remember uh, going to Prince Albert's, like the palace? <laughs> yes. And then they threw that big yeah. party and there was the big ABBA dance show. Mm -hmm. it, was it was this, great. It was amazing. This huge, like, it was like a Vegas floor show, but it was like disco and ABBA and all these, like, these, like, torch songs. And 
and the, at, at every table there was a, a vase of rose the, the, the rose buds or the, the heads of roses like floating in a and at some point someone during one during I think the winner takes it all uh, someone threw a rose on the stage and this was a room of hundreds of people and thousands of roses and suddenly <laughs> everyone started throwing roses at this poor woman who was singing the winner takes it all and it, and it was amazing it was like this thrilling like moment at uh, this like live moment and then yeah. and then it ended and she like she cowered away having been pelt by rose rose heads and someone had to come up and sweep them up because like it wasn't supposed to that wasn't supposed to happen i'll never forget it we were so drunk and just and then prince albert got up and he was like dance everyone dance man they know how to party when we lost you i know everyone has different kinds of um internet we were talking about Broadway debuts because there were so many people getting ready to make their Broadway debuts before this pandemic happened. Um, do you remember yours? Because yours was Picnic, directed by right. Scott Ellis yeah. at the old Criterion, yeah. the old Bonds clothing store. Would you talk about your Broadway debut and what you remember about that night? Well, uh, it was uh, spectacular. I was so thrilled to be, you know. But it was uh, one thing I remember from that night is. Um, it was with Kyle Chandler. Oh, boy. Yeah. It was with Kyle Chandler. And um, there was always a part in the play that we always got the lines wrong. And we always mixed up the lines. And we just, and it drove Scott Ellis, who directed it, insane. Yeah. Like for weeks, he's like, God, get those lines right. It's killing. And, and and for a period of time, we did get the lines right and la 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 and the previews. So he was okay, but uh, we sort of fell into our bad habits and he would just explode. And um, so opening night, we're like, dude, we got to get these lines right. I mean, he's like, I know, I know, I know, we're going we're gonna to get them. And he would sit in the back of the theater, even on opening night, like he, he, he's, a, he's very nervous watcher, you know what I'm saying? At all. And um, so we're do we're coming up to that scene, and we're all like worried. You know, we don't want to anger Scott out, <laughs> especially on opening night. It's like a cliffhanger. I know what happened. I want to find out what happened. Opening we night. gotta know what happened. <laughs> Everybody, hang in there. This is what the internet's like when you're in Austin, Texas. I'm sure they're sharing. I'm sure his internet's being shared by five thousand people. <laughs> that's like, that isn't isn't Austin, Texas city or something? I think it's like where the internet started. <laughs> But you know, the weird thing is when you live in a house, it's all brought in from a line outside and everybody's yeah. home. Every kid is at home playing video games. Everybody's right. online doing something. Right. So we're going to wait for the cliffhanger when he gets back. But <laughs> there are so many actors watching this from all around the world that are thrilled you're all here. And one question that always comes up is auditioning. Like actors always say, I never know what's going to happen when I walk through that door, what they're looking for, how I should behave or what I should do. Were both of you always good at auditioning? No. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> auditioning is, is not the same as acting. I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, like to an extent, like, I, you know, now there's like more and more self taping and that's, and that can sometimes be like, like, like what it's like on a, on a, on like a TV set or a film set kind of, but it, it, like auditioning is like, you know, you go into a room and I, you know, like it's, it's a, it, you have to put on a little show and especially like in the theater, like, you know, like, you know, there's like, like the first day of rehearsal, you, you, you can't have all the answers or, or why would, what are you going to do for the next month? I mean, like to it, like you have to sort of show up on a TV set with the performance that, you know, you're going to put on film, but, but with theater, you know, like, aren't you auditioning for the first day of rehearsal as opposed to like opening yeah. night? I've been in, I've been in, I've, I've been a reader in auditions for something that I was already cast in or something. And like somebody won't get, won't move, move forward in the audition process because it wasn't like really ready. And I'm like, well, what's ready? It's not opening night yet. This is not the same thing. Uh, you know, like th this is, this is a totally different skill. And, and some people are really good at it. 
um, and and some people aren't. And I was always, I mean, I the, I, I still I can still I still get sweaty when I think about auditions that I've tanked. I want to go back to that. Before we lost you, Tate, you left us with a cliffhanger. You were like, there we were, opening night. Scott Ellis is in the back of the house, the criteria, stage right, when you yeah. were getting ready to do your thing. Finish your story. So so we're, we're doing the scene. We realize that we're getting the lines wrong. Like, I started the sentence. You know, and we're just in the jumble. And in the corner of our eye, and you know, the blackness of the audience, the doors fly open, <laughs> and Scott Ellis has ran out of the theater, opening night of his own play. And you know, he just like, and we were like, oh God, we're in trouble. We just like sagged in front of each other. We we're like, oh you no. Know. And we were like, but, you know, he was very, he was very sweet at the, at the end. We were just like, oh, he's going to kill us. He's going to kill us. But it was opening night and we got a standing ovation, you know, and he was in a good mood and he was like, you guys are the worst. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we're like, we're sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, but it was Did amazing to see the director God. of the play literally run out of the theater because he couldn't take it. <laughs> Our idiocy. during the run get that scene right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it a night that Scott was there or you just told him, we did it perfect tonight? <laughs> totally, yeah. I think the <laughs> stage manager would like, you know, tell him, you know, Scott, they blew it tonight or, or you know, they're, they're, they're doing better, you know. I think once actually the pressure of opening night was off, we, we got it easily, you know, like yeah. we totally forgot that we, you know, but classic. You should have bribed the stage manager with whatever they loved, champagne or red wine or something, and just say, please, in tonight's notes, just say that me and Kyle were perfect. Scott, sorry you weren't there to see it. Yeah. <laughs> so, when we lost you, Tate, we were talking about auditioning. We have so many actors of, of all ages watching around the world, and the question that always comes up is auditioning. And, you know, are you good at auditioning? And Michael was telling me he was terrible at it. He sweats through auditions. Michael, was there a horrible audition you gave that you actually got the role? Me? Yeah. Um, actually, a... I, the, so when I, when I weaseled my way into How to Succeed, they asked me to come in and sing for uh the musical director and i um i and i was really nervous and i decided i was gonna i was gonna wear i wore a suit because i knew that they would wear i would wear a suit in the show and they and i and i prepared a song that i thought would be similar to a song that i would sing in the show and i and i had it all figured out and i got there and we chatted and they were really it was really casual and then they were like, well, just go over and sing with David. And I went over to the piano and David was like, sing this note, sing this note. Um, now do this syncopation. And they were like, okay, great, that's it. And I was like, well, well, you wanna hear my song? I prepared a song. And they were like, oh, oh, okay. And I did the song, not one laugh. They watched it like, and I left and walked home and felt horrible. I thought I, I stayed too long. I should have left when they were done. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't want more. I had the job and I and I blew it. Um, and I was devastated because I thought that that was my chance. That was going to be my Broadway debut. I was going to be in the musical I'd always wanted to be in, and I yeah. screwed it up. But then I got it. So what I was, was the song you did? What did you prepare? I sang "Poisoning Pigeons in the Park" um, by Tom Lehrer. Yeah, which is a funny, it's like a terrible just, song, and you would have been brilliant doing that. Yeah. I was, but they, uh, <laughs> they did not laugh, that. but they cast me, so it was all right. Dana, were you, were you, like I said, were you good at auditioning? Did you have a bad audition that you got a role from? Or I think auditions are a necessary evil, and they just have not figured out how to go around that, you know, and everybody should just be offered a job is what I think. <laughs> Um, and I don't have a partner like Michael who can tape me and do self tapes. I don't even know how to do that. I do remember I once had an audition for a sitcom, and uh, I went in and I did it once, and you know it was kind of like not good. And then I started it again, and I stopped halfway through, and I said, you know, I'm just not funny. And I got up and walked out, and they were like. 
what? I said, no, I'm just not funny. Thanks. And I walked <laughs> out. And but I really, and evidently it became legendary that it went around that I had done this in this audition. And the fact is, what I really wanted to say, but I was being polite, was this is not funny. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I had said that instead, because it was not funny. And they said, Dana, we know China Beach is a drama. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, you know what really changed my whole auditioning life yeah. was becoming a director. Like, fortunately, I've sort of directed a lot of television shows and um, I love auditioning actors because I learned so much from them. And, and, and the one thing I, I want to say to every actor who auditions is just know your lines. Um, and do do the best you can, and whether you get the role or not, ninety percent of the time has nothing to do with. It's completely out of your control. It's so out of your control. There's so many times where an actor has come in and just been perfect, it's been amazing, but it's just not what we're all looking for. And um, it's just sort of like just just. Um, Actors in general don't know what they're giving off. They don't know uh, the good stuff that they're giving off. They don't know the stuff that's unnecessary that they're giving off. They should just give themselves a break and um, uh, just enjoy it. And, you know, because Dana, you know, I'm, I'm with you. It's like, um, well, I, actually, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm just the opposite of you. It's sort of like I miss auditioning with people in the room. I mean, I, I'm not a fan of, of putting myself on tape because I love, you know, working with someone else and, and uh, maybe the director or casting agent going, hey, try it like that. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, great. It takes me out of my head so much where it's, if I'm just on tape, it's just me, you know? And um, just, it's just a very self-conscious experience. So anyway, just try to enjoy yourself, have fun and, um, you know, uh, don't get down on yourself. You know, don't be like Michael Yuri and uh, on the way home think, uh, you know, I should have left earlier. <laughs> yeah. I'm having, I'm, I'm getting a mug made that says, "Don't be like Michael Yuri, take that." <laughs> <laughs> it used to be and like, "Be like Mike." Know. Well, don't be like Mike, <laughs> Michael Yuri. <laughs> you know, my final question for all of you is, what have you learned about yourself during this hunkering down at home during this pandemic? Well, well, I'm. This is not too different from my normal life. Actually, <laughs> right? I mean, I'm very lucky, you know, that I can have a house to live in, and I'm by myself most of the time anyway, and I'm kind of a loner. So, yeah, really not that different, I have to say. My husband is like that too. My husband's like he liked to social distance a long time ago, so he's like he has not been out at all. He's like I'm fine with this. I can deal with this. So yeah, he's yeah. good with that. Michael, what have you learned about yourself during this stay at home? I don't miss parties. Yeah. <laughs> I miss the theater and I miss restaurants. Um, but I don't miss, I don't miss, you know, like, uh, I don't miss that. Uh, I don't miss the obligations of like parties. Huh. Yeah. Beautifully put. Yeah. Kate, for you. I, um, uh, you know, it's funny. I, I just am like, uh, when the threat of it, all of it being taken away, I just have how much I love to work, how much I love to show up on set, how much I love to go to the theater and, you know, rehearse and work with actors and directors and, and crew. And, you know, I just... Um, you know, in that moment where, you know, they shut everything down and, you know, we didn't know, we still don't know. So, uh, the fact that, damn, I'm so lucky that I've gotten to live my life doing yeah. what I always dreamt of. I mean, like, I'm from kids from New Jersey. I, I can't believe that I got to be on a Broadway stage or on a television show. It's like, it's crazy. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm just on, the, on my knees praying that I get to do it again. <laughs> I hope I hope it all works out and because uh 
I, I really miss it and love it and feel so lucky that I've gotten this. It's been a long time doing it. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for doing this, but I also want to thank our audience today because we have people watching all around the world. And if you're thinking of making a donation, of course, there is the Actors Fund, there's Feeding America, and there's also BroadwayCares.org. What's great about Broadway Cares is this was the six weeks that they, they normally raised all their money at the fall time with the Red Bucket Follies, where they go into the theaters and you know around the country and on Broadway, and they would raise over $6 million. They didn't have that this year, so they went online with their COVID-19 Emergency Assistance Fund. They have raised, I think it's, it's well over $5.5 million, which they have already given to the Actors Fund. Awesome. So it's like if you're thinking of donating a dollar or $5 or $10, think of these wonderful organizations that give back to either the arts or to Feeding America. And listen, this has been a dream. I've known all of you since you made your debuts, either at an off-Broadway show. I've spoken to you all on carpets. I was there for all your Broadway openings. And like I say, I thank you. All of you, stay safe. Wash Everybody wash their hands. The theater <laughs> will be back better than yes. ever. Television and film will be back with whatever the new now is and how people are going to be, you know, glued to watching this stuff. But I think we're all going to be focused more of just connecting to the moment when we're finally with each other again and not worrying about, you know, what's happening two weeks down the line. I think when we finally get to be with someone and connect eye to eye, it's going to be that personal eye to eye contact that we're going to have again that we've lost for a while. So I hope we get that all back. And again, I want to go back to the podcast for a second of where people can find it. There are new episodes that go up every Thursday in May and June at www.thepackpodcast.org. I cannot wait for Shakers, which is Dana's. I can't wait for April and Parrots, of course, which is Michael and Tate. Listen, stay safe, everybody. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Love Great you. To Thank you. you. Great to Great see you, Dana. Bye, guys. Bye.